Today we're going to be referencing quite a few different scriptures, but you'll want to keep a finger in, in the book of 1 Corinthians. Um, actually, what I have in mind is not so much a typical sermon or, or teaching today, but more of a talk, I guess from pastor to people. Uh, the analogy that's used in the scripture is, is sheep. The, the word pastor really is related to the word pasture, and the idea being that you're the flock, I'm the shepherd, and one of the jobs that I have, uh, that I'm called to here as a pastor, involves protecting you. Now, there's other things that I want to do. I want to make sure you're well fed. You know how Psalm 23 talks about how the Lord is our shepherd, and, and it talks about how he leads us into green pastures. I want you to eat well, and so I want you to have a healthy spiritual diet, and I hope you are getting that, a balanced diet, uh, a deep diet, a rich diet uh, in the Word. So that's a job that I have. Uh, I obviously need to give some guidance to you, so leadership, uh, you know, a shepherd is going to lead the flock, but also a shepherd is going to have to protect the flock. And the threats that are the sneakiest, I've found, are good things that are then taken to an unhealthy extreme. And I got a phone call a couple weeks ago from Wenatchee, and I'm looking at this phone number, it's not ringing up a name, but I, it, it does tell me it's, it's coming from Wenatchee, and I don't answer it, because I, I, is this a solicitor? I don't know. And they don't leave a message, they call back, and, and finally I do answer it. And it's a guy I remember meeting one time, and this was maybe 20 years ago. In fact, I think it was longer than that, maybe 25 years ago I had met this man, and, and he called me, and he said, I need some help. Uh, he, he's a grandfather. Uh, but he's calling me on behalf of his son. And his son's a follower of Christ. His son is a very dedicated follower of Christ. I, I don't know if this is the right thing to say, but I think he's too dedicated as a follower of Christ. And as his grandfather's telling me the story, his son has gotten so spiritual. I'm going to use the word hyper-spiritual. That... About a year ago, he left his family. Why? Because he was following God. And they weren't. Not to his expectations. So he left behind a wife, uh, kids who are college age. He's basically abandoned them to pursue God. And evidently he thinks this is a God thing, and I'm thinking it's not. It can't be. You know, when your dad's upset, when your wife's upset, when your kids are upset, he hasn't given a dime to his family to support them or help them. His grandfather's saying, I'm paying all the bills now for them. I'm, I'm taking care of my, my kids in college. My, my, son, my son's not working. That's the other thing. About a year ago, he just quit working. So he has no income. He's couch surfing. And there are other spiritual people who are taking him in, you know, and actually encouraging him in this. And, and this grandfather's going, what, what do I do? What do I do? I had an experience last week in Hawaii where after the, one of the sessions, a lady sat down with me and, sweet lady, sweet lady, kind of a nervous sort, you know. In fact, I was kind of shaken with her there, you know. I'm like, are we both supposed to be doing this or just you? And, uh, and then, you know, she starts to tell me about her week. And I don't know why she did tell me about her week because it kind of got her into trouble at the end. She, she goes... Yeah, I just want to describe to you my life. She says, Monday morning, I go to a women's Bible study. Kay Arthur, have you heard of her? I said, oh yeah, yeah, that's great stuff. And then Sunday afternoon, I go to another women's Bible study that's at a different church. You know, have you heard of that? Oh, yeah, okay. And then Monday night, you know, I, I have a small group at this church. And then Tuesday morning, and she, she goes through her week. And literally, morning, noon, night, morning, noon, night, morning, noon, and night. She's involved in something everywhere. And she goes... Somebody told me about a recovery group. Should I do that? <laughs> and I said, okay, here's the deal. About halfway through your description of your week, one word popped into my head, addiction. I think you are overdoing this thing, big time. And you know, spirituality can be a buzz. You know, worship can be a buzz. Being with other believers, learning stuff from the Bible, this can all be a buzz. It can be, it can be a coping mechanism to not really do real life, to do this other synthetic life. And I said, a couple problems I see with this. You're taking in so much information, there's no way you can assimilate this into your life. 
You're hearing stuff in these Bible studies that's truth, truth that needs to be lived out. How do you even get to practice that? You're going on to the next thing. You're bombarding your mind with information. There's no way you can live all this. And I said, the second thing is, how do you live this out? How do you reach out to others? Where's the time now to actually go out and be Jesus to this world? I, I don't think this is going to work. I don't think this is working for you. And I said, here's what you should do, I think. Pick one Bible study and one small group and get involved in recovery. Recovery from spiritual addiction. I know this might seem like a weird thing for a pastor to be saying, hey, cool it, you guys. But, um, you know, there's growth. You know, there's cellular growth. You know what happens when cells start growing and they grow out of control? You know what we call that? Cancer. Cancer. Cancer is actually a good thing, in a sense. We want cells to grow, right? Remember how years ago, Toyota kind of had a problem? in that you'd step on the accelerator, some of their vehicles, and the accelerator would not come back. I mean, you, you, you let up to want to slow down, but the car keeps going fast. And there were several people who had accidents, got killed. And I think they figured out that part of it was the floor mats, but I don't think that was all of it. Anyway, there was a big settlement. And you're saying, well, don't you want the car to go? Yeah, we want it to go. We also want it to stop. Don't you want it to go faster? Yeah, we'd like it to go fast. We also want it to slow down a little bit. And this is what I would call hyper-spirituality. Now, the third thing I'd say, just to set the stage, is we are open to the gifts of the Spirit here. I'm going to say some things that might sound limiting or controlling about that. And there are some people who don't believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Like when they read in the, in the New Testament, the book of Acts, the things that were happening there, some people just say, well, that stuff doesn't happen anymore. And I'm not one of those. I actually think those things happen. I think God still works through all the gifts, we are open to the gifts of the Spirit here, but not in the emotionally based manner of Pentecostalism. Not in the manner in which you've seen where things actually can roll into pandemonium. I don't know if you've ever been in one of these services sometime. I have. Where, where things are just off the hook. It's unintelligible. And, and you know what? This goes way back. This was happening in the first century. You know? And so I can see how it could happen here today. And so about two weeks ago, I, I just read through the book of 1 Corinthians. And, and I, would, I would give this as, a, as an assignment to any of you. In fact, I would give it as an assignment as a prerequisite. Like if after this talk today, you really want to come and talk to me. <laughs> First thing I'd ask you to do, this would be required. And if you call me to set up an appointment, I'll ask you this question. I want you to read through the book of 1 Corinthians in one setting. Okay, start to finish. It's a marvelous book very balanced. It talks about how valuable our gifts are that God gives to us, but also it puts a little bit of a, of a handrails out there for us in terms of how we use these gifts so that nobody gets hurt, not the user of the gift or the person who's receiving the gift. It's really a marvelous book. So I'm open to any conversation about this. I'm not saying that I've got it all figured out. That's not where I'm coming from. But I do read that book and I did read it in one setting, and I thought, wow, it's all right there. Everything we need to healthfully exercise spirituality and spiritual giftedness, it is there. Some people, I get the feeling that they're chasing an experience. And, and i got to say, we're not chasing an experience here. I'm not, anyway. I'm chasing Christ. Now, when you chase Christ, sometimes it is an experience. I've found it to be a real lively experience. When you get involved with Jesus, when you, when you pursue him, when you sing these songs, when you open up your heart, there will be some things that will happen that are unexplainable. <laughs> They're out of this world. And I would say this, God is the author of the supernatural. I just don't think he's the author of the strange. Like, are supernatural things happening? Are supernatural things going to happen in your life? Absolutely. I, I have no question about that. And we are open to all of that. We are chasing Christ. But we're not chasing an experience. And what I, what I find is when people start to become an experience chaser, and there's, there's a buzz that you can get being in certain contexts, feeling the Spirit. When people start chasing that, I think somehow... That becomes a distraction, actually. We're no longer 
pursuing the main thing. We're now off on this side track. We're, we're kind of going after one of the byproducts instead of the essential. And so I, I, I just want to share, uh, this is kind of a, you know how presidents used to have you know, a fireside chat, you know, they'd get on the radio and say, you know, my fellow Americans, you know. Uh, th this is just kind of one of those today. And, and let me just share 10 problems that, that concern me when I think of hyper-spirituality. I want you to be spiritual. I want you to be vibrant. I want you to have a, an intense, vital, personal relationship with Christ. I want all of that for you. I don't want you to become a wacko. You being a wacko is not good. And so, number one, the great man of God problem. Paul addresses this. This is where there's some person, it, the great man of God theory is this mistaken notion that God primarily works through some great man or some great woman. And you find this sometimes where, you know, there's somebody out there, some evangelist, some prophet, uh, some person who has these words of knowledge, and that person is almost seem, they, they, they're almost like untouchable, you know. We could never, we could never question what they say. Um, they're, they're, they're being used of God, right? You hear this language, right? And, and, it, and, it, and it sets aside the idea that God is working through all of us all the time. And, and all the gifts matter, and everybody matters, and, and it sets up this unhealthy relationship with this person. It was happening back in the, in the first century. Some were going, I'm of Paul. Others were saying, well, I'm of Apollos. And Paul says, what after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? He's speaking of himself now in third person. Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord is assigned to each of his task. Everybody's got a task and some people's tasks are pretty important. I think the Apostle Paul's task was pretty important. He's carrying out a task, period. He, he puts his pants on, or maybe in his case a robe or a dress, I don't know. But he, he puts his thing on the same way as everybody else. In fact, I find it really fascinating. Uh, there's a piece of art over in Mount Vernon, Christ the King, that uh, Bob Williams, who's a painter in Mount Vernon, he painted this mural on the wall, and I told him to do it, and he showed me the picture out of the book, and, and then it got up on the wall, and you had all of these people standing around Jesus in various colored robes, and then there's Jesus in the middle wearing white, white robe. And then there were lights that were like shining on him. It's like, whoa! <laughs> and I said, I said, Bob, I said, love the painting. And I said, you, you obviously followed it right out of the book. I get it. Would you go back and repaint Jesus? Give him some kind of normal clothing. Regular guy clothing. There, there's something in us. There's something in the artist who painted the original, obviously. who said, no, I don't want him to be like everybody else. We need somebody who, you know, I can tell you, Jesus wasn't like wearing a Superman costume. He was just like looking like the rest of us. Now, he did some things that were out of this world. He said some things that were out of this world. But it wasn't from an external. And we have this idea of propping up these people. And really what we see in Scripture and what we see from Jesus is understated leadership. Humility. Servant leadership. He's the one, when they get together, down on his knees with a basin and towel, washing their feet. That's leadership. And so I get nervous when I see people who kind of prop themselves up. There's one person right now who's very popular. And, and I don't think that the people know who are following him that he left his wife and family. They're back in England right now going, what the heck? He got all spiritual, moved to America. Everybody's quoting this guy. And I'm going, I don't get it. I don't get it. That's not greatness in my book. Second, the off-road driving problem. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. When Jesus was, uh, was, was here on this earth, he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. 
he was saying, this is the point, this is the, this is the crux of it. This is the main road of Christianity. It leads to the cross. But there are people who are doing all kinds of off-road driving out there. And by off-road driving, I'm talking about they're not keeping the main thing the main thing. Like they're making it about the gifts. The gifts are not the point. The gifts are to be used to draw us to Christ. Christ is the point. The giver of those gifts is the point. We're the conduit. That's it. We're the conduit. The gift comes through us. But the conduit's not the point. The the people who have the gifts, not the point. What gifts you have or don't have, not the point. The point is Christ. The point is Jesus. Number three, the God told me to behave this way problem. Um, I've had people just in the last few weeks, say some incredibly vicious things to me and then turn around and say, well, sorry, God told me to tell you that. I'm going, really? Because I'm opening up the Word and I'm reading about Jesus, how He was, and I'm reading how we've been told to live, and I'm reading about God's kindness and greatness, and I'm going, you know, that's not how... I see God treating people. And, and it says here in 2 Timothy, all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching. That's, you know, what's the path? Rebuking, okay, you're not on the path. Get back on the path. Correcting, okay, let's get back on this path here. And training, let's stay on this path in righteousness. You're going to find the righteous path laid out in the Scripture. And God does not contradict Himself. We've got to keep one finger in the book. And if God supposedly tells you something, you go, wait a second, that's completely contrary to what I read in Scripture. It's pretty clear it's not of God. Because what is of God is right here. It's in the book. I've had people say to me lately, God's telling me to no longer be a part of a church or no longer go to church. I'm going, wow, that sounds like the enemy, not God. It sounds like something that Satan would be putting in somebody's mind. Yeah, don't don't get around those Christians. Stay completely away from them. Don't, don't be under any kind of godly teaching. You don't want that. That could really mess you up. I said, God is always about reconciliation. It's Satan who's always about division. Look at his, look at his game book. I mean, he's played this thing out. Look at, the, look at the nation of Israel. It got divided. Look at the church. It's been divided. I, I, never, I never give God credit for that. That's not his doing. He, he's all about unity. Read the end of the book. Read the end of Revelation. <coughs> it's a reunion of people from every tribe, nation. This is the heart of God for people to come together. And when God is supposedly telling us, no, we need to come apart from each other, I'm going, no, I don't, I don't believe it. Number four, the rules, what rules problem. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14. If you don't want to read the whole book, you just want to read kind of the, the high point of it. That's it, 12, 13, and 14. He really lays out really well, Paul does, some boundaries here about spiritual gifts, how they get used, and and how they can be abused. And and particularly in chapter 14, uh, you know, there's there's some ways that things should be done. For instance, when it comes to speaking in tongues, Paul says in chapter 14, only two or three people at, at the most should ever do it. Uh, one of the rules is there, there always has to be an interpreter. So if somebody's going to speak in tongues, there has to be somebody there who can interpret that and make it intelligible for everybody else. It says in chapter 14 that it's better to have somebody speak in a known tongue than in an unknown tongue. So if somebody can give a message in a language that everybody understands, let's do that. Not have somebody speak in an unknown language. Is this common sense? Almost. I mean, it's like, okay, there's a bunch of people in a room. Somebody's going to get up and speak in tongues. Or we could have somebody get up and speak in English. (laughs) And Paul says, hey, let's do this. The tongues is a real gift, and it has a real function, but it's been so misused, and people are just like throwing the rules out the window. Here's a kicker, and this is super politically incorrect. 1 Corinthians 14 says women shouldn't say anything. Ouch. Should I run for my car right now? (laughs) They're supposed to go home and talk to their husbands first. So there's rules there. There's rules there. And here's the biggest rule, and this is the one that matters most to me, love. 
1 Corinthians 13 makes it so clear that love is the rule. Love rules everything. Love is the governor for every gift that you might think of. 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, I don't think there is an angelic tongue. I think he's just using this as a, as a reference point to say, hey, I don't care what tongue you're speaking in. He says, but I don't have love. I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I am making noise, but it has no real effect for people. It, it's only a distraction to them or maybe even an annoyance to them. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, there are people who have the gift of prophecy. They, they can understand mysteries. But I don't have love. If I have a faith that can move mountains, we have people, by the way, in our church who I think have every gift that's described in Scripture. I can point them out to you. We, we have prophets in this church. We have tongue speakers in this church. We have apostles in this church. We have people in this church Everything that's described in Scripture, it's, it's here. It's here. But, he says, if I don't have love, I mean, it's nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but don't have love, I gain nothing. At the end, he says, the greatest of these is love. You want to know what the greatest gift is <coughs> that you can possibly have or the, possibly give? It's love. Nothing beats that. I don't, I don't care what thing you can maybe conjure up or the Holy Spirit might do through you. You can't beat this. Love somebody. And I, I back that up by backing up here in 1 Corinthians 12, the very last verses of 1 Corinthians 12. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles? Let me ask. These are rhetorical questions, right? What's the answer? No. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? No. Do all work miracles? No. Do all have gifts of healing? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. Do all interpret tongues? No. But eagerly desire the greater gifts. There are greater gifts that we all can do. And now I will show you the most excellent way. Chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love. Love is the most excellent way. Love is the thing that we can always say yes to. Love is the thing we can all have. And love trumps all this stuff anyway. So go for love. Love has to always rule. So if I'm exercising my gift in a way that's not loving, I need to be quiet. If you're, if you're doing it, same thing. I mean, love has to rule. Number five, the my gift is better than your gift problem. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. There's somebody here in this group today, we can't see what they're bringing. And you know what? What they're bringing is vital. It's critical, indispensable, he says. Wow. He says, the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. Think about this from your body's standpoint. I mean, you got something that's like oozing or a growth. You actually care more about that than the parts that are supposedly healthy. This makes perfect sense. And, and really, the gifts... They're, they're not even ours. They are spiritual gifts. They are, they are the Spirit's gifts. All the gifts are supernatural. And what he's saying here is all the gifts are needed. Every single part of the body actually ends up mattering. And so if ever somebody says, well, this is really spiritual and this really matters, but no, not so much that, they're wrong. They're just flat out wrong. Number six, the demon behind every bush problem. I had a lady tell me a story recently about how she had, a friend of hers was talking and saying, you know, I, I've got a headache. I feel like I've got a headache. And, and another lady who was standing there goes, you know, we really need to pray against the demon of headaches. And my friend said, have you taken any ibuprofen? <laughs> um, are you drinking enough water? 
And, and here's the problem I see with the demon. I, I believe in the demonic. We've had demonic activity here. I've had demonic activity in my home. I, I've, I've dealt with demonic activity in other people's homes. I've, I've cast demons off of people. I don't think that's my strong suit necessarily, but I, I certainly am not afraid of demons. Uh, greater is he who's in, in me than he who's in the world. I'm, I'm not worried about demons. But when you start to think that everything's a demon, what it really does is it absolves you from dealing with other threats. And there's really three here. The, there's the world, there's the flesh, and there's the devil. When, when my anger flares up and I say, oh, it's the, the, the demon of anger again, instead of going, no, that's my flesh. That's good old Dave who likes to take too much control. You know, it takes different stuff to deal on these different fronts. You know, really to deal with your flesh, what's required is character, which has to be formed by Christ. It's, it's making spiritual decisions over and over again until those decisions become the regular ones. And your flesh says, ouch, I don't get to do what I get, wanted to do all the time. I don't get to be my normal self. And, you know, the devil, obviously, you need to take authority over the devil. He, he's below us. But these are two different means of responding to the same thing. And if, every, if, if all you've got is a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. And, and I think what ends up happening is people go, man, I'm, this is a demonic thing, this is a spiritual thing, everything's demonic. I'm going, no, there is some. But if you just see this in balance, maybe only a third of the stuff that's going on we can really give Satan credit for. I mean, a lot of it's the world. First John 2.16 says everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. There's a world system that is impacting us all over. And we've got to stand against that. We've got to have a discernment about what is truly of God and what's truly of this world and get away from that stuff. Number seven, that I have all the authority I need problem. Um... Everyone needs to have authority, and never, everyone needs to be under authority. But what I see from some people is, yeah, I'm under authority. I'm under God's authority. Well, what's God think about that? God actually has instituted authority, human authority, for our benefit. And, and the advantage of saying, oh, I'm only under God's authority, is there's no one but God to really challenge your point of view or to really bring any correction your direction. But God has put those people in place. He talks about Ephesians 4, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. There are people that God puts in our lives. You look at the, at the last chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, talks specifically about how important it is that we have spiritual leadership in our lives. I would not want to try to be a Christian without somebody being a spiritual authority over me. And I have that. I actually have a, a committee that I met with this last week, and I give a report on my life every year, and they speak into it. And in fact, this year, they told me some things that I will be doing. Okay? I'm glad they did that. It's for my good that they did that. And I'm submitting to that. No one can just go out and just do whatever they want to do. And this is my concern. Number eight, the altogether now problem. This is the idea that if... if if I have a gift, let's get together with other people who have that same gift. And, and let's reinforce that. But in Corinthians it says, To each one the manifestation of, of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there's the Spirit of the message of wisdom. To another the message of knowledge. To another, you know, gifts of healing. Miraculous powers. Prophecy. Distinguishing between spirits. Different, speaking different kinds of tongues. Uh, interpretation of tongues. All of these are the work of the one and same, same Spirit and he gives them to each one just as he determines. We need all of these. And we need these distributed. What I see sometimes is what I'd call gift colonization. Where around a particular gift, maybe it's prophecy, maybe it's tongue speaking, we all come together and do this one gift. Well, where are the other gifts? And, and, the, and the funny thing is, is then they look back at the other churches and go, yeah, they don't speak tongues over there. Yeah, because there's nobody left there who speaks tongues. You guys all pulled all the tongue speakers together. You pulled all the prophets together. And they're not evenly distributed through the body. Like they were supposed to be. Then number nine, the I don't give a rip what other people think problem. 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and, your, and all your strength. Here's a key word. Second. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Remember, Jesus was asked for one, and he said, I'm not going to give you one. I'll give you two. And I, I, I've seen some people who are so spiritual, I've had them say exactly this. I remember a lady in Mount Vernon who wanted to worship in such a way that she was going to distract everybody. I can tell you the focus would not have been on Jesus that morning. It would have been on her. And when I asked her to do, the, to, to do a simple thing, I said, would you worship in the back where it's not distracting? I'm not telling her even to change her way. She goes, I'm going to dance in the aisles. I'm going to strut up front. I don't care what other people think. And I said, you know, when you said dance in the aisles and strut up front, I was following you. But when you got to I don't care what other people think, you lost me. You know, because with Jesus, he says it's always in love. And it's always in concern for others. And I have a concern when somebody says, well, God's moving in me, and I don't care. That doesn't sound like Jesus to me. Number 10, the I know something you don't problem. And I've had this happen just recently too, where, you know, it's been communicated to me, well, you don't get it but one day you will, that sort of thing, which is spiritually proud, condescending. And and Scripture speaks so clearly about humility, being critical in all of our interactions, but there's sometimes a spiritual pride, a spiritual condescension, that I, I have something from God you don't get to have yet, but maybe someday you will, And this is spiritual control sometimes and spiritual abuse sometimes where people actually get beat over the head spiritually. I want to close by just quoting Jesus. One of the things he said that I really liked as an analogy is he said, you know, some people like to clean the outside of the cup. And, uh, and we all have choices to make. We can spend all the time cleaning the outside of the cup. Or we can clean the inside of the cup. And I think what Jesus was saying, and, and I agree with this, it is much more important what's happening in you than what is happening through you. What's coming out of you. What's coming in to you. I think that is the critical component. I've tried hard to train myself not to judge a person's spirituality by what I can see. I I think there's some profoundly spiritual people in this room. And if we were to do it based on what we see or know of you, we, we could get it wrong. We really could. It, it, the Bible says man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. Scripture even says that there will be some people who stand before the Lord at the end and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Think about that. People who are casting out demons and saying they did it in Jesus' name and Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. I never knew you. Which just takes us back to where I started. It has to be about Christ. I want to know Christ. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. I want to be in an intimate communion with him. Let's bow for prayer.